without further ado, let me turn this over to Jeff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benson. Um, glad you all could join us today. Um, uh, Doug, Ryan, and I will spend uh, the better part of the hour walking you through an agenda that highlights some of the performance improvement um, challenges and opportunities confronting uh, municipally owned, county and district owned uh, hospitals. Um, with that, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Doug Johnson, who's going to walk us through um, our um, an overview of kind of some of the challenges that are facing these organizations, as well as some industry uh, trends. Great. Jeff, thank you. And Benson, thank you. Good day, everyone. Uh, we appreciate your making a few minutes to join us today for this webinar. Um, so today's webinar will, will focus on the performance improvement imperative for community-owned hospitals. Let's see if I can, there we go, I can move the deck. Um, we, as, we, as we proceed through our, our, our presentation this, this morning, uh, we're going to have four poll questions that are distributed throughout the presentation, and we hope that you'll um, take a minute to thoughtfully participate in each of those, and, and, and Benson will coordinate those as, 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 we, um, as we approach each of those. Um, but first, a few highlights from our previous presentations uh, that have focused on, on community-owned hospitals, county-owned, district-owned, um, uh, and, and, and the like. Um, a few of the key uh, main points that we've that we've discussed in previous in previous presentations. Um, I don't need to remind everyone that we're living in a very dynamic healthcare environment. Um, you know, managing our organization's strategic risks uh, is is especially imperative. Uh, the risk profiles continue to change, uh, and 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 can have far-reaching effects to the extent that they don't go addressed. Um, it's interesting, occasionally we'll have, or I'll have a client who will say to me, whether it's a board member or sometimes a member of the medical staff or someone from the hospital leadership will say, you know, if we can just get back to the way it used to be. Um, unfortunately, uh, that's, that's not an option for any of us because the way that it used to be doesn't exist anymore. Um, one of the things that we've, we've chatted a lot about in our previous webinars as, as we focus on these community-owned hospitals is the extra layers of responsibility and accountability, um, that trust and communication are so important uh, when you have these extra layers, when you have a, uh, a hospital leadership team uh, and, a, and then a hospital board, and then on top of that, you've got perhaps a public board, whether a, a city council or, or, a, or a county commission, um, and improved communications uh, and, and, and forging a relationship of trust between those, between those layers is so important. Um, and not to mention the, the fact that um, a, a common fact base that's shared amongst those constituencies uh, is, is, is an important way to help uh, keep everyone moving in the same direction and, and, and makes it easier to make objective decisions. And on top of that, a, a, a shared vision that unites those shareholders uh, is is also a, a way that that can help uh, for for the for the organization to move forward effectively. You know, if as as you look at uh, relationship uh, uh, constraints and challenges, and and the shared vision and a common fact base, if you if you struggle to accomplish those things within your organization, uh, very often it's going to impact your oper the the operating performance of the of the hospital organization because these distractions become uh, very costly from an operations perspective. Um, so let's let's revisit a couple of industry trends and some headwinds that continue to plague. Sorry, I'm going to try to. There we go. Uh, that continue to be a challenge for not just for community hospitals but for providers across the board. Um, as we've talked about before, consumers and patients are carrying more of the financial load and more of the financial responsibility, um, which which puts greater financial risk on the on the hospital organization. Um, you know, essentially, what's happening is people are now shopping for care, uh, and people are deferring care. So as they shop for care, they're looking for services in in more cost effective cost effective, less costly venues. Which, which typically uh, are, are outside of the hospital. 
and people are deferring care, which means that there's lower volumes. And it also means that when people do show up at your hospital, they tend to be sicker. We've talked about in the past, these reimbursement headwinds. Um, Medicare margins continue to decline. Uh, they're expected to continue their decline into the future. Um, you know, as, as, the, as the baby boomers age into the Medicare eligibility, it means you need to be able to survive in a Medicaid world, in, in a Medicare world, uh, which is not always easy to do. And, and many of the commercial payers and their methodologies are tied to Medicare rates and Medicare methodologies. Um, so this, this slide uh, highlights the fact that Medicare margins have, can, have declined uh, precipitously over the last couple of years. And they're expected to, the, the 2018, they're projected to, Medicare margins are, spoke, are projected to be uh, about negative 11%. Moody's, the credit rating agency, uh, has highlighted the fact that hospitals are, they're doing a good job of managing their um, managing their expense growth, but but the expense growth continues to outpace annual revenue growth. So hospitals are fixing their cost structures, but you can't cut your way to prosperity. Um, and, and it's difficult to find volume growth when more and more services are migrating out of the acute care setting into more cost-effective ambulatory, ambulatory care settings. Uh, so Moody's expects that going forward, at least in the next into the next year or two, that nonprofit hospital margins will continue to be suppressed, uh, and these are some, and and Ryan is going to highlight some of the strategies that address these challenges uh, in just a minute. So let's go back and revisit just quick briefly some of the unique, um, the some of the unique nature of of these community-based uh, county and district-owned hospitals. Uh, you know, if if all of those headwinds weren't enough. Uh, the declining margins, declining volumes, uh, changes in pay, paying methodologies, the, the, the changing care revenues. Um, again, you add another layer of complexity uh, to, the, to the governance structure of these municipally based hospitals when you've got um, multiple layers of governance that sometimes blow the line of accountability. Unfortunately, sometimes you have, a, you have political agendas uh, and poor communication that will undermine uh, effective board functions. And sometimes when, when, when those types of issues spill over into the community uh, and spill over into the public, into public debate, it becomes more difficult to, uh, to recruit people, talented people to participate on these boards. Um, so, you know, the, some of these points that, that, we'll, that we talk about here is um, regarding the unique nature of the, the county and district and hospitals. These are very broad based points. Um, all of you uh, have uh, enabling legislation uh, that was used to create your hospital districts or your hospital organizations that are owned by communities, whether it be a, a county organization or a city organization, and they all have unique provisions that you need to consider. Um, so I would, I would encourage all of you to consult that enabling legislation uh, as, you, as you strategize around how do, we, um, how do we move our organizations forward. You know, sometimes some of these enabling legislations don't allow the hospital organization to expand outside of their county or their di or, or their district boundary, which really puts them at a strategic disadvantage. Um, and there are some in some states and in some circumstances where um, uh, you know, bankruptcy, which can sometimes be a useful tool for restructuring and resetting the an operating strategy, those types sometimes those tools are not available to a, a municipally owned hospital. You know, it, it becomes difficult to to set a strategic path sometimes when you're when you're trying to operate uh, within the the bounds of of open meetings and sunshine laws. Um, very often, tax support and mill levy uh, can mask the actual financial and operational struggles of your hospital. Um, and you know when when operating when eroding operating performance uh, at your hospital is, it starts creating risk for the community from a, and from a taxpayer's perspective, um, that's, when, that's when the hospital and the, uh, becomes, um, you know, the hospital really becomes everyone's business at that point, and it becomes, uh, you know, a complicated business and critical community resource becomes a source of, of, of division. Uh, and that's when, um, 
you know, and, and that's when it becomes a real challenge to uh, to uh, to build on that common fact base to pursue that that shared vision um, and to and to move the organization forward. So that's sort of a highlight of what we've ad addressed in our previous webinars. Um, there's a our first poll question is 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 um, is to be teed up now by Benson, and then after we do this first poll question, I'll turn the time over to Jeff. Thank you. So we've got this running now. Just trying to understand so we can tune this presentation to who we have present. What best describes your role in your organization, whether you're on the board, whether you're in the management, whether you're in the county, district, or city management, whether you're in the physician or physician practice management or legal counsel. And so we'll give it a, a few seconds here and uh, let it collect. Great. Well, we're waiting for some of the, the results of the polling question. Um, I think the, the, one of the key differentiators in the county district owned, municipally owned a hospital space is the existence of two boards, both of which have fiduciary responsibilities to key stakeholders. Um, you know, the hospital board um, um, has a fiduciary responsibility as operator. The owner of the hospital, whether that be the county or the district or perhaps the municipality, um, has a fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayers and the community at large. And that is, in, in a nutshell, um, kind of the, the, the locus of a lot of um, the conflict. And it looks like we're primarily hospital management today, so we will adjust accordingly and uh, take it on from there. Terrific. Um, what I would like to talk about um, um, as we uh, move forward is some of the, the findings and observations we, we have taken from our work in this space uh, over the last decade, decade and a half. And we've worked with a lot of county, district, municipally owned hospitals over that time and have worked both on behalf of management and the hospital board and also at times in, in on behalf of the district or the county um, in that time. And what we find is um, it can become a high conflict, high dysfunction environment. Um, and the causes of that conflict often generate are generated from a series of events that can play out over decades. Um, clearly, eroding hospital operating results can be um, a, a uh, key catalyst. Um, the decision to reduce hospital service, services also can create a lot of anxiety and potential conflict and distrust in the community. Um, medical staff relations, uh, a popular physician is um, contract is not renewed or employee, employee issues can also become something that, that is, becomes part of the agenda, if you will, between a, uh, a county board and a hospital board in that case. Um, it can occasionally, in, in some instances, be a, a source of contention between a hospital board and management, and doubtless those of you in management have seen that um, potential arise over the course of your careers. Um, one of the things we would note is that when you get into these high conflict environments where there's a high degree of public interest, um, the natural response can be for the county or district to really want to engage in a lot of oversight and delving into management uh, responsibilities. And the flips reaction of that can be um, uh, a, a decision and a tendency of the hospital board and management to um, kind of uh, uh, take a defensive crouch, if you will, for what they know will be a lot of public criticism. And so you end up with this um, dissonance in terms of the information asked for um, by a board, if you will, or the public, and the information that folks are willing to present that can be confidential and certainly competitive, uh, sensitive from competitive situation. Um, differences in risk tolerances and per perceptions of risk can be important. And one thing we should never overlook is, you know, again, these relationships have developed over decades. And People's uh, parents may have been on the board. Um, they may have had relatives who were doctors in the community or um, uh, had a bad experience in the hospital. All of this stuff can be part of the agenda and becomes very personal and personality driven at times, which is a real challenge. Um, so a lack of transparency, poor communication, personality conflicts, and 
and um, that mix can undermine the trust. What we found in terms of how you move beyond conflict and arrive at solutions and strategies is it's really important um, that there be a communication vehicle um, for the parties to begin to, to engage one another across the table constructively. So creating some sort of joint task force or joint committee between, in this case, if it's a district board and a hospital board can be really critical. Developing a common fact base. Oftentimes these dysfunctions are based upon misperceptions or misunderstandings of actually what's occurring. And so developing that common fact base and educating stakeholders as to what's going on uh, both in the industry uh, and also in the organization is really important. And then lastly, um, hopefully coming together over a shared vision for what's really important for the community. Those three things can begin to smooth the waters and in many instances allow a community and its key boards to move forward. So just some observations there as to um, prior history. When we think of the challenges facing healthcare organizations today, we think of it in terms of risk. Uh, and risk comes in many shapes and sizes. In this case, we're describing risk as having four vectors. There's financial, operating, value, and market risk, all of which go into an organization's risk profile, and any one of which can spill over into other uh, vectors. So for instance, if financial results are very poor, um, that can have a significant impact in the market position and market risk that an organization is facing, and also the operating performance, the inability to invest in new equipment, new staff, uh, implement um, new policies and systems that might not have short-term return on investment, but could be really important for quality and long-term uh, operating sustainability. So these are all related, and poor performance in one area can really increase the acuity of the overall organization's risk profile, but also how it performs in other, other vectors. One of the things I would note in our experience is that um, there is a tendency for boards not to have a good sense of what the strategic risk profile of the organization is, and that many changes can occur slowly, gradually over time, and boards are often unaware of, of where they are in terms of um, how their strategic risk profile has changed. And that's something that I think creates uh, the opportunity for, for confusion and misunderstanding. So just briefly, these are some of the indicators that we would use and we suggest that organizations use to monitor their strategic risk profile. You can see that a lot of these are financial and operating, um, many of which you probably monitor today. And then as we start getting into value risk, start talking about alternative payment methodologies, population health, we start looking at things like total cost of care, attributed covered lives. These are a little newer uh, for organizations. Thinking about whether they have a retail pricing strategy uh, for consumers that are exposed to first dollar expense via high deductible health plans. Uh, charge variability in terms of the messaging that sends to referring providers and consumers. All um, somewhat new, but, but increasingly important for organizations. And then lastly, um, the market risk indicators, which I think are things that we all think about, uh, looking at market share and those trends. Uh, the challenge with market share is that it's a lagging indicator. And so by the time you realize that market share has eroded, um, it, it can be, um, you know, you're behind the eight ball, so to speak. Um, the point here, and really setting up Ryan's talk, which he'll, he'll dive into here in just a moment, is that performance uh, and operating results, both financial and using other operating metrics, are really um, key drivers of risk. And one of the best ways for a management team or a board to manage their risk profile is to focus on operating results and ensure that those operating results uh, hit desired levels. And that really is, is the um, gist of, of Ryan's talk and why we're focused on uh, performance improvement um, as a really important lever for management teams and boards uh, in this very challenging environment. Ryan? Thank you, Jeff, and, and thank you, Doug, for giving me some time today to, to speak with our um, webinar attendees around really this, this imperative around performance improvement for uh, county, district, and municipally-owned hospitals. Um, 
you know, as we've discussed previously this morning, uh, what what each individual organization is experiencing in terms of uh, compression of, of reimbursement and revenue and then an attempt to control costs is, is not something that's occurring in a vacuum. As you can see here, we've just provided a, a five to six year trend line on the operating cash flow, the, the EBITDA earnings before interest, depreciation and amortization for one of our own clients in the last few years. Importantly, uh, this operating EBITDA cash flow, it really is the lifeblood of a healthcare organization, which is so capital intensive. And the ability to maintain and grow cash flow is really predictive on the overall long-term success of the organization. And for this client, at the, at the micro level for this client, what they saw was a steady erosion in their operating cash flow over the last several years to the point where in 2014, they were not only meeting their debt service obligations, but also reinvesting into their existing asset base to the point by 2017 where they had a negative uh, uh, cash flow and weren't sustaining enough cash flow to make their own debt service responsibilities. Um, this is just a you know a really uh, particularized review for this client on where they are relative to the overall industry. But when we look from a macroeconomic perspective, what this client ex was experienced is no different than what um, hospitals across the country have experienced. So I think since 2010, almost 160 hospitals have closed uh, since 2011. And by our count, over 100 hospitals have filed for bankruptcy. Um, and it just provides very um, clear data points around the difficulty of the operating environment and the reality of, of what hospital managers are having to deal with on a day-in, day-out basis, and then how board members um, as, as fiduciaries are being challenged with maintaining the mission of the organization while also addressing the imperative around um, preservation of margin. So, you know, fundamentally, we have to ask for, for an organization, when should you begin to address issues of performance improvement? Jeff provided a very useful matrix that helps us to conceptually categorize different sources of risk. Um, but when you're down in the weeds of operations on a day-in, day-out basis, you know the reality of declining reimbursement. You know the reality of reduced inpatient utilization. Um, and you, you know that that places operating constraints on the way that you do business. And it fundamentally requires that you retool the operations to match with this evolving and shifting um, demand or volume for services. The challenge, though, is, you know, as these one-off events uh, continue to transpire, um, the operating risk, the operating profile of your organization continues to erode. Um, and what we have seen working with clients is that all too often, many of them, whenever we are brought in to provide them with assistance on performance improvement related issues, they've, they've said, we really wish we would have called you guys one or two years ago. Um, and when the macroeconomic operating environment is so challenging for all hospitals, it's easy to think that you know everyone else is struggling and we're just going to do the best that we can with the resources that we have. But what we've seen and experienced um, working with these organizations is there's often certain warning signs or indicators that would suggest the organization is increasing the amount of stress or distress of its operation. You know, one that's very clear and easy to recognize is um, declines in net patient revenue, where it's beyond just a one-year data point, but it's actually starting to become a trend where for two or more years you've seen a decline in net patient revenue. That's often coupled with a recurring inability to, to meet your budgeted levels of performance because your revenue expectations are, are off from the budgeted levels. Additionally, um, and I don't think this is surprising probably for many of the folks um, joining us today, uh, distressed organizations have a hard time uh, finding the capital necessary to reinvest into um, needed capital infrastructure or clin clinical equipment. Uh, an MRI machine that's, that's broken may not be replaced or um, repaired for some time because you just don't have the money to do it. Or a leaking roof is, is patched but not fully replaced. Uh, limited resources in a distressed environment really um, put stresses on what you can and, and can't do with your limited available capital. 
Additionally, um, you know, debt can be an effective instrument for helping you fund some of these capital and clinical infrastructure needs. Um, but in an environment of, of amplifying uh, layers of stress, it's not uncommon, and we've worked with quite a few clients where they've unfortunately um, experienced certain, certain triggering events that would impact their bond ratings, bond covenants, or other forms of financial commitments they have in place that, uh, you know, increase the, the, the stress of the operating environment and require some immediate level of, of addressment for those issues. Additionally, and especially with um, smaller healthcare organizations, you know, a single provider, whether it be a general surgeon, a employed primary care physician that um, provides a steady stream of patients at the hospital, or even key management um, personnel, the loss of one of those resources can create a pretty large vacuum that becomes hard to replace and has to be solved for rather immediately or otherwise a deterioration in operating performance um, is likely to occur. And then finally, um, because managers in these situations are, are so focused on just keeping the day-to-day the -day activities of the hospital running while uh, trying to find time to address those larger issues of, of strategy, um, it's just hard to find the time to develop and utilize the internal tools that would allow you to monitor and then make necessary adjustments to your operations to, to match this evolution in service demand that you may be experiencing over you know, a handful of years. So, you know, what would be helpful, I think, at this time is uh, if Vincent can open up our second polling question, we, we'd like to hear back from uh, you all and understand what, if any of these um, different triggering events or warning signs are things that, that you've experienced in the more recent past or stand out as, yeah, the, these certainly are warning signs of distress. So at any rate, we've got a number of people jumping in here. We'll keep it open for a few more seconds, but uh, seem to be getting quite a, a variety of responses. And the, the thing I would note, and I think Ryan, you triggered this, is it can be difficult when you're in the week to week, month to month operational imperative to be able to step back and look at longer term trends. And I think this, this certainly is a challenge for boards it can be a challenge for some members of management unless they're able to look back and see these longer term trends. Uh, for instance, the, the um, two or more years of declining patient revenue. So yeah. it would appear that uh, the declining revenue is the, the one that most people have seen. And uh, I'll turn it over Great. and let you go from there. Well, that actually provides a, a rather nice segue then to um, a specific set set of initiatives around growing operating or growing revenue inside an organization um, to help realize performance improvement. I think Doug said it earlier today where you can't cut your way to prosperity and we certainly believe that to be true when uh, working with clients who are addressing their own issues of performance improvement. <clears throat> um, when we think about revenue enhancement opportunities for clients that are in varying degrees of stress or distress, uh, there's there's a question around how immediately do we need to recognize revenue growth because there's a certain set of initiatives that can be done to enhance revenue over the short to intermediate term versus those things that are going to uh, take a longer time to appreciate the ROI on the activity. In terms of those more immediate sources of, of revenue growth that really can help extend the runway and um, for a more distressed organization uh, provide it more time to effectuate other uh, turnaround strategies. What we have commonly seen and, and worked with clients to address are issues around the revenue cycle and business office um, management. You know, importantly, it, it, if you're going to deliver and provide services to patients in your community, uh, you should be able to do so at, at, a, at a price point that's competitively priced for those services. So if it's an issue of a charge master that's not been updated for some period of time um, or uh, code utilization, certain codes that are not being uh, effectively utilized and money's being left on the table, um, you know, just quickly making adjustments uh, to, to your, your charge master and 
reviewing your, your code utilization and then better utilizing available codes out there for routine services can provide a pathway for more quickly and effectively recognizing revenue growth inside of an organization. Uh, and it's it's one thing to to, to code and, and price more effectively for those services. It's another to actually get paid. Um, and that's really where focusing on billing and collection practices and then um, better addressing your denial management process really help ensure that those services that you've delivered and that you've um, provided a bill for, you're able to recognize the revenue off of it. Um, you're bringing down days in AR. Um, you've developed a more effective means for addressing uh, denial of claims and helping to, to relitigate those claims with the payers. And then your billing and co collections practices are efficiently ran and operated so that um, patients aren't receiving bills month after services, um, but in a more timely and effective uh, window or period. You know, another area that uh, we routinely see um, an opportunity for more immediately realizing improvements in financial performance um, rests with your, your provider base. Uh, I think it's no surprise to those of us in the industry that for, you know, the better part of 10 years, uh, an, incre an incredibly increasing number of physicians now are directly being employed um, by healthcare systems and hospitals, and those clinics are being owned and managed by, by the hospital. These um, employed providers and, and their clinics truly represent critical assets um, to the organization. And like any asset, it's important that um, the hospital be able to realize um, a higher return on those assets. Uh, where we routinely see opportunities for performance improvement inside of these physician um, employment relationships and then their practices uh, rest with your provider productivity. Um, how effectively are your providers and how efficiently are your providers seeing and processing patients relative to, you know, a, 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 a relevant cohort of other providers in their own specialty area? And then at a, at a clinical practice level, do, is your clinic set up and optimized in a way so that it best promotes um, that enhanced provider productivity. You know, together, those, those two pieces, ensuring that your providers are productive and that they have a support network of staff and mid-levels in place that it can enhance and promote that productivity are truly critical to making sure that your existing assets inside of the organization are being best utilized and realizing a return for your group. Um, and then uh, more recently, uh, things that we've seen some of our clients begin to better uh, utilize are um, the different uh, reimbursement methodologies that are available to, to different clinics. Um, over the last several months, a uh, few years in fact, we've worked with organizations to um, help them set up and establish uh, their clinics as rural health clinics and then benefit from an enhanced set of, of reimbursement available to those RHCs relative to other forms and designations. Uh, turning to some of the longer term activities around revenue enhancement, um, you know, it's always beneficial if you're in an environment that would support it to uh, work with your payers to renegotiate, examine and renegotiate those contracts to enhance your reimbursement. Uh, routinely when we're working with clients in the area of performance improvement, it's not uncommon for us to encounter a, uh, a payer contract that, that's gone the better part of a decade without any reexamination or renegotiation. And often our clients are, are leaving money on the table, whether it's through uh, an improvement and reimbursement in their market or other uh, facilities or just provisions inside of the contract that could be better utilized to recognize more revenue inside of the organization. You know, just providing a review, an effective review of the universe of your payer contracts, and then developing a strategy for approaching those payers can provide a pathway for, on a more intermediate term, um, beginning to realize a, a stronger source of, of revenue from, from those existing relationships. And then for those clients that have, that find themselves in pretty hostile or, or, or difficult um, payer contract environments, um, many of those organizations are increasingly skipping over the payers and directly contracting with large area employers um, for, for certain services, a menu of services um, that often can provide 
uh, some greater um, assurance around the volume of services that may be coming through the organization, which is important when you start thinking about how to solve for the payment of, of just fixed costs inside of your organization. You know, knowing that you're going to have a certain amount of volume um, on average every year from a local area employer can provide greater predictability, not only from a budget perspective, but also in um, developing out staffing schedules and other operational aspects to, to, to the hospital's um, operations. And then finally, uh, it's, it's really critical and important, especially for clients that in organizations that have a longer runway and have that um, the luxury of a greater period of time to realize revenue growth, to step back and review your strategic position in your market and examine the service lines that you're currently um, providing to area patients um, uh, relative to what neighboring or competitor, competitor facilities are doing, and then to understand what the areas of growth are from a service delivery perspective, and then strategically make investments either into existing service lines or to new service lines uh, so that you can uh, grow the pie of the organization from a revenue perspective moving forward. So, you know, just some, some thoughts here to, to, to summarize these, these revenue opportunities moving forward. Um, it's really important thinking back to that, that barometer we provided previously around stable, stressed, and distressed to understand where you're at and then to let that um, inform the speed to impact that you need to realize on revenue enhancement opportunities for your organization. You know, we think it's critical when you think about uh, pursuing revenue growth opportunities that you be able to quantify and then execute on those opportunities, which are more uh, immediate sources for revenue growth. And we commonly see that revenue cycle enhancement is, is one of those areas, almost uniformly across the board. Um, additionally, it's important that you, you make sure that your clinics and your employee providers are provided with the necessary training and, and equipment and practices to allow them to operate more efficiently um, and effectively because those, again, represent important assets to your organization that you want to be able to realize the most effective uh, return on. And then finally, as you're examining longer term, longer term sources of revenue growth, what's critical and important is that you be able to measure the ROI, the return on investment from these longer term growth opportunities. And then, from a very strategic perspective, be able to decide how to prioritize the use of limited dollars to pursue these growth opportunities. And if we can, Benson, let's turn here to poll question number three and try and get an appreciation for um, where some of our attendees today have, have seen challenges in, in growing their own revenue. And we've got that up now. so. And say which areas you face challenges. Please feel free to check all that apply. And uh, getting some some responses in now. So we'll give it a few more seconds to collect and then uh, move on. And I guess we have most people in at this point, so I'll go ahead and close the poll and see the results. Great. Thank you for that feedback. Again, I think that's anecdotally consistent with, with what we're seeing and experiencing. And um, the fact that there's across the board issues just, I think, speaks to the challenge um, that, that organizations face. And, developing revenue growth strategies. Uh, turning then to, to the, the expense side of the equation, you know, again, you, you can't cut your way to prosperity, but especially given the, the, the mission of county district and municipally owned hospitals, it's important that that we be good stewards of the resources that have been entrusted to us. And that's really fundamentally at the end of the day what um, controlling costs and addressing opportunities for expense reduction addresses is stewardship over important community assets. 
you know, there's a number of areas in which hospitals can tackle um, cost reduction opportunities. You know, supply chain, GPO utilization, um, examining your benefits plan and whether or not there's an opportunity to, to redesign that in a, in a way that would generate cost savings is, is an opportunity, as well as reviewing, you know, service and vendor contracts to understand whether or not you're getting the best rate for those services or if um, putting those vendors to work through more competitive pricing um, hurdles would, would be beneficial. You know, one, those, those are just some of the many cost reduction opportunities available for healthcare organizations looking to realize performance improvement. Where we'd like to spend some time today is, is focusing on labor productivity and staffing, because at least in our experience working with different organizations across the country, on average, salaries and wages makes up anywhere from 50 to 60 percent of total operating expenses. Um, th this is a significant component to the e expense and cost in running a hospital. And because we know there's declining inpatient utilization across the country and a, and a change in the way that healthcare is being delivered, it's important that we be able to step back and ask whether or not the way that we have set up our staffing practices, you know, matches with the volume and the demand for services that we're uh, seeing inside of the organization today. Because when we've worked with clients to better titrate their staffing levels to match to the demand for those services, we call it demand-based staffing. When, when we've worked with organizations to implement a more demand-based staffing um, set of, of staffing levels, those organizations um, on average have been able to, to generate anywhere from 10 to 15 percent savings through reduced labor expenses. Critical though to, to realizing you know, this savings through um, responsively staffing relative to patient volume or service volume. What's critically important is that your frontline managers be equipped and empowered to make those demand-based adjustments. Um, you know, I, I know different organizations have different look-back windows for reviewing their staffing levels relative to different ratios or patient volumes or other, you know, uh, worked hours or units of service uh, to make adjustments. Um, the frontline managers really are the ones best positioned to make that adjustment um, and close as close to real time um, relative to others inside of the organization. Um, these adjustments need to be quick um, to realize the full benefit of a demand-based um, staffing program. And again, that's why frontline managers are so important. Uh, so what, what we like to um, suggest to clients exploring an opportunity to better staff so that it's responsive to changing and evolving um, patient demand for services is that, um, again, you start from a perspective where you can quantify the opportunity. How have we staffed over the last several pay periods relative to a worked hour per unit of service and, again, a cost center or department? Um, and how does that stack up relative to, you know, some external benchmark of a cohort of facilities that, you know, look and feel similar to us or what we like to increasingly use is the, your, the organization's own internal 25th percentile zone for, for most efficient level of staffing. How have we as an organization most leanly and efficiently staffed in the past relative to, to the volume at that point in time? And what are the barriers we're experiencing today that are keeping us from um, pre breaching those prior domains of efficiency. So critical to the success of, of realizing these cost savings through a demand-based staffing system really begins with executive level sponsorship. Um, having someone in the C-suite who's a champion for these set of um, initiatives um, and then um, rapidly identifying and quantifying the opportunity in this area uh, so that a, a goal can be established around which folks can work towards. Importantly, uh, once that quantified opportunity is articulated, it's important that the relative units of service be identified, the right work hours be established, and uh, initial performance goals, as, as we like to call them, are set up within each cost center so that the organization can design, implement, and track improved financial performance across the different cost centers and departments uh, in a way that's responsive to the changing and involving um, uh, demand for services or patient volume. 
and then critical to just realizing the sustainability of, of this lean efficiency of lean, lean and efficient um, demand-based staffing is is again the the prerequisite really that your frontline managers um, be trained and the responsibility for monitoring and assessing and then reporting on staffing levels relative to these efficiency domains that that be that responsibility be transferred over to frontline managers and that they be empowered to um, uh, with the guidance of, of appropriate department leaders make adjustments to um, staffing levels that responds to that evolving um, demand for services that that can change on a shift by shift basis and uh, with the with this Vincent if we can let's turn to our last polling question so curious you know what your organizations have utilized in the past in terms of look back windows for reviewing your staffing practices and patterns and then making um, informed decisions about um, the levels of, of future staffing. Is that something that um, you guys have done quarterly, monthly, biweekly, weekly, or, or even venture as far to do it on a, a daily or a shift by shift basis? And we'll let that run a few more seconds. We're getting fairly good response here. Looks like um, most people are in the monthly, but because uh, the last votes come in and then show the results. And yeah, looks and like monthly is the big winner. Yeah, and, that, and that's not terribly surprising. So we've, and, and Jeff and I in particular, have had a, a client in the not too recent past where they were making those review periods a, a quarterly activity. And, and unfortunately, you're really losing a lot of the opportunity to um, better staff your organization in a way that's responsive to demand when you're when you're waiting a full quarter to do so. Um, monthly is is certainly an improvement over a quarterly review, um, but for for us, when we're working with clients or providing counsel to clients on better um, exploring more uh, efficiently and leanly staffed staffing, uh, we like to collect pay period by pay period data, um, drill down to a particular volume on a on a day by day and a shift by shift basis, and then start working with the frontline managers to capture and report that information so that at least on a daily and and, at, and with some organizations eventually by shift by shift basis you've been able to track and make adjustments to your staffing level so that you're not overstaffing, but you're, you're meeting essential minimal regulatory requirements for staffing, um, which all of us have to um, pres or prescribe to or, or meet, uh, but, you're, but you're also hitting those internal uh, established performance goals um, and you can make needed adjustments on a, on a more quickly and responsive way. Uh, you know, importantly, uh, when we think about performance improvement for, for our clients, at the end of the day, you know, the financial outcome and performance of the organization is, is critical. No mission, no margin. Um, but it's also important that um, performance improvement take into consideration the, the questions and issues around mission, and specifically that it be centrally organized around ensuring that um, um, the patient experience is enhanced and improved. And what we have found uh, working with, with other organizations is that enhanced financial performance and enhanced patient ex experience are not mutually exclusive um, uh, sets of outcomes, but they often work together and are accomplished through um, pursuit of, of both. One of the ways that we, we design and have worked with clients to realize enhanced patient experience as part of an overall set of performance improvement efforts is to really focus on the existing processes that touch to and impact patients on a um, on a day by day basis inside of these organizations. So I don't think it's surprising to anyone on our on our call today on our webinar today that over time certain processes can crop up um, that that are meant to be workarounds but um, really serve as patches to help solve for larger issues or problems. Um, and uh, cumulatively, while they individually ha have have the best intentions, cumulatively, you know, they can crop up like weeds and really slow down um, the efficiency of of the organization. 
Um, we've seen these these patches or these workarounds really spill over and have unintended consequences as it relates to, you know, the admissions process and un, you know having that not be coordinated or, or delays um, delays in patient discharges, um, impacting uh, patient wait times whether it's in a clinic or um, waiting on a, a procedure or a lab service inside of the inside for an inpatient. Um, extended treatment times, high costs, and increasingly um, low reimbursement um, relative to those high costs. And a lot of those issues um, are, are most present um, inside of the emergency room. <clears throat> it's important when examining these issues around um, existing processes and the workarounds that have been developed that you know organizations um, be able to focus on opportunities to be more efficient and maximize the available reimbursement that you're receiving in a way that enhances the care quality and then ultimately leads to uh, an improved patient experience instead of outcomes because our patients are our ambassadors they're our best marketers and if they have a good outcome and a good experience um, that has a multiplier effect for how effectively um, we can market to the to the broader community. So increasingly, um, reimbursement um, is, is tied to patient outcome, patient experience, um, and, and other associated factors. Um, and if we can improve um, our care delivery in those domains and do it in a way that efficiently uh, maximizes the revenue and the reimbursement that's being offered, um, you know, we can create and institute processes inside of an organization that um, enhance the patient outcome, um, but also create a, an improved bottom line financial performance. So when we're working with clients in this area, when we're examining the admission process, um, ED operations, um, the discharge process, whole, whole number of different um, operational components to that patient experience, uh, we, we like to work with our clients to, again, quantify the financial impact associated with improving your quality scores, um, reducing your length of stay, and then decreasing your patient wait times. And then importantly, um, because these processes um, have developed and existed inside of the organization and um, in many ways become sacred cows of, you know, we this is the way we do it because we've always done it, it's important that you be able to provide an objective level of review over that process and then come to some conclusions around how things can be better organized in a way that more efficiently leads to um, enhanced patient outcomes, enhanced quality scores, and uh, maximization of, of revenue in a way that balances the needs and constraints of the provider and clinical staff along with um, the patient. Um, and then, again, importantly to the success of these types of um, redesigning of processes, it's critical and important that you know, department leaders and providers be partnered with in this process. Um, and, and that requires that they be fully involved um, in the design of new processes and that the new processes be grounded in enhancing the patient experience. So with, with some remaining time here, I just want to quickly move through um, just a handful of things as it relates to best practices for, for performance improvement. Um, you know, we like to think about this in, in terms of three different units of activity. The first is where you're rapidly identifying and prioritizing, you know, those more immediate PI opportunities. Um, this is where you're really priming the pump inside of the organization to identify those opportunities that um, um, are most readily accessible and things that can be moved on most immediately. And the goal here inside of your organization should be able to identify those activities and arrive to a set of next steps, actionable next steps, um, within 10 business days. Um, again, this helps prime the pump for the larger set of efforts around your organization's performance improvement plan, um, and it helps create the necessary internal energy and momentum um, to help bring the organization along and realizing a, a broader set of changes. You know, once you're in a position to launch on those prime pumping activities um, uh, after the first two weeks, um, you know, alongside that, that's where the organization can really turn to more comprehensively assess performance improvement opportunities and, and really leave no stone unturned as it, it relates to finding opportunities and then um, quantifying the opportunity uh, associated there and then 
sourcing the right resources to help execute and, and, and move on those initiatives. We think a good rule of thumb is that this initiative be something that can be accomplished within 20 to 25 business days for one calendar month. Um, again, ensuring that it's a rapid process is important um, because it helps create a sense of urgency um, that's necessary for getting um, activity and movement inside of large organizations. And then finally, um, you know, once these initiatives are underway and initial success has been registered, um, it's important that the leadership in the organization, those responsible for implementing on the plan, really start to turn to um, effective execution and then maintenance of the improvement that's been registered to date. Uh, that's where we think it's important that you have a dedicated resource that's in charge of the implementation of the performance improvement plan. You know, the, the management team is, is busy, again, with day-to-day -day activities and issues of strategic importance. It makes it really hard to, to check in on each minute detail of a performance improvement plan and see where things are at relative to, um, to the identified target goal. But having a dedicated resource in this area um, re really helps to ensure that the trains are running on time and that no, uh, no carts are, have left the track. Um, importantly, um, having a reporting period in place that's at least bi-monthly to the right executive level of sponsorship over the performance improvement plan is important, and that you be able to track the performance improvement plan's performance against the initial baseline that was developed early um, in the process. And then as you start turning towards um, the longer-term sustainability, that's really when the organization should be focusing on ensuring that it has the proper set of resources and processes in place to sustain the results that have been generated today. So just some guiding principles that we'd offer to those um, on the webinar today as it relates to realizing performance improvement inside of your organization. You know, we really do feel that it's important that this be an initiative that's led by experienced experts. Um, a, a turnaround is quite different from many of the other issues that an organization may encounter in, in, in inside of, of its operations. And having someone that's been through this before um, that knows what stones to unturn um, and is um, experienced in bringing along others inside of an organization to help realize that change is really critical to ensuring the success of the overall performance improvement plan. Uh, we also are firmly committed to the idea that you be able to quantify the impact of the different initiatives that you're involved in, especially when you're in a situation that requires or demands enhanced financial performance of the organization. If you can't quantify it, why it makes it harder to justify expending resources and time and energy in pursuing those opportunities. Um, engaging stakeholders in communication and ensuring that they're confident in the work that's being done is critical to the long-term success of your work. And ensuring that you have the right communication plan and you're speaking to the right people along the way is also important. And then again, centered on the mission of the organization, all the things that are being done have to address and be rooted in a focus on clinical quality. But again, the, the, two, the, the two activities, pursuit of performance improvement and enhancing of clinical quality, are not mutually exclusive. They are tied together, and um, uh, both uh, can see a cons commensurate increase when, when jointly pursued. And an, an honest reflection as well as necessary on what resources you have inside of the organization and whether or not you need to have access to any flex resources that can be brought in for this specific purpose around specific performance improvement initiatives or overall project management over the plan um, is, is critical um, because if, if this is a opportunity to significantly enhance the operational and financial performance of the organization, an investment into the right resources to realize the success um, is not a, a, an imprudent decision. And then, you know, all the time, energy, and resources that are utilized to realize this initial, initial success, uh, it's, it's really critical that those results be sustained and that after you've um, begun to experience um, enhanced performance, that the team begins to turn to 
the development of sustainable resources and processes to continue that work and make it a core component of the organization's operations moving into the future. So those are just um, some initial areas um, to, to, to share with you all in terms of performance improvement. Again, it's, it's a combination of revenue enhancement, cost containment, um, and then um, putting together the right process and resources to go after these critical opportunities. Thank you, uh, Ryan. We, we do have a question that's been submitted that we'll answer right after this. We recognize we're running a little bit long, so we will send out the question and the response as a slide attached to the slide deck when we distribute that uh, to folks. What we do want to do is close with a couple of things to remember. Um, one of the challenges of district, county-owned, municipally-owned facilities is you don't get to select your own market. And because you're mission-driven to an extent that other organizations may not be, I realize most healthcare organizations are mission-driven to a degree, but it's really difficult to grapple with some of the challenges of, of managing that enterprise in a, a very challenging operating environment. And the thing to remember, obviously, is if we don't have, we're not able to generate adequate margin, we will undermine our ability to sustain our mission long term. Um, and so the, the, the key point is to um, rapidly identify and quantify performance improvement opportunities. Uh, it's an essential step. That allows you to establish the return on investment, the ROI, and that then also allows you to prioritize scarce resources. Where do we put our focus for making sure we can achieve the margin we need to sustain our mission long term? Um, ensuring that you have the right resources and processes to sustain the performance improvement results is critical. It's not You don't want a one and done because uh, organizations tend to revert to the mean, and that can be a challenge. Lastly, one of the things we would ask you is that you, you keep attuned to your organization's risk profile uh, and appreciate that it's dynamic. It's not a static uh, element. Um, operational performance is not just one element. It actually probably is the key element of risk that allows an opportunity for management to mitigate and address that risk profile over time. So important um, takeaways in our estimation. Um, with that, I'll ask Benson to... Um, um, pose the question. I will, just before Benson takes you away, note that contact information for Doug and Ryan and myself is included in the slide deck. Um, Benson, the question. question was, uh, where in the hospital do you see the biggest operation performance improvement or the opportunity for performance improvement? Ryan, do you want to take that? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the revenue side, and this is um, I, I don't don't feel like this is a generalization. I feel like it's probably a factual statement. All of the organizations we've worked with um, to address issues, performance improvement, from revenue enhancement opportunities, there, there's always been um, work to be done and uh, new revenue to be collected from um, focusing on the revenue cycle. Um, all too often, the the charge master and updates to the charge master can become decentralized or the not, not the right departments be incorporated into the process. And um, uh, you miss out on the opportunity to bill and collect for certain services that, that you're providing because you're using old codes or um, um, referring to wrong codes, and that increases your denial issues. So across the board, uh, I think where we work with clients on performance improvement issues, revenue cycle has been a rich and fertile field for um, making improvements from a revenue enhancement perspective. And then again, from, from a cost containment, um, just because of the sheer size of, of labor relative to total operating expenses, um, the organizations that we work with routinely, um, we find opportunities for um, instituting a more a demand-based set of, of staffing practices and procedures that allow those organizations to more efficiently and productively staff their departments. Thank you, uh, Ryan, very much for that. Um, I know we've got another question um, that, that was asking about a, a model for demand-based staffing, um, and we can provide that to attendees um, after the webinar. We're going to adjourn. We've run a little bit long. 
certainly appreciate all of you attending. If there's follow-up questions um, that folks would have, certainly feel free to reach out by email or, or a phone call. And um, again, thank you for attending this uh, webinar uh, by Stradwater Associates. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.